Welcome to Mr. Biz Radio, biz talk for biz owners. During the next half hour, Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth, a leading business advisor and two-time best-selling author, will cover topics that will help business owners run their companies more profitably and more efficiently. If you're ready to stop faking the funk and take your business onward and upward, this show is for you. And now, here's Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. All right, welcome to another episode of Mr. Biz Radio with me, Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. And we are going to talk today about a topic that each and every one of you will be interested in, and that is scaling and growing your business, um, especially as we're heading into, well, we're in increased inflation, potentially heading into a recession. I personally think we're heading into a recession, uh, not trying to be negative, just trying to be prepared. And so scaling and growing is, is really, really important right now. And it's probably the opposite of what you hear from most places, right? So a lot of people talk about when things get tough, you kind of just hunker down. I have the exact opposite approach to that. I feel like those downturn create opportunities. If you are positioned properly, it creates massive opportunities, not just opportunities, massive opportunities. Um, and I know during the pandemic, a lot of my clients, you know, as a fractional CFO, we were positioned for those and we were able to take advantage of some of those things. And by take advantage, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I mean, we were positioned to where we were able to not only the weather, the storm, but thrive and grow through this, through that storm. So that's what we want to talk about today. And we have, of course, an expert with us today, uh, Miss, Miss Natasha Miller. Natasha is not your average CEO. She sits at the helm of Entire Productions, which has been an Inc. 5000 listed of fastest growing companies in America for not one, not two, but three years in a row. Natasha studied entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School and MIT and is a trained classical violinist and accompanied jazz vocalist. So she's got all kinds of talents. I'm really curious to talk about that, Natasha, actually. Um, she now resides in San Francisco, California, where she's a member and is on the regional board of EO, which is Entrepreneurs Organization. You know, we've talked about that before. So welcome to the show, Natasha. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So look, even in your background was so intriguing to me because, you know, me, I, I couldn't play, I, like, I, I want to think I can play a musical instrument, but I'm terrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I've joked before in the show, like um, that uh, video game, um, what's it called? Rock band. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think I'm a rock star, right? I sing, I play the drums. I, I feel like I know what I'm doing. I have no clue what I'm doing. And what I found is typically people that are, you know, kind of businessy type people usually aren't very musically talented. I don't know, just my opinion. Um, at least this guy is, it fits that mold. So, uh, so tell us about your journey. Uh, you obviously have a very interesting background. Tell us about your journey, Natasha. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think creatives have a tough time accessing the analytical um, systems and processes uh, part of their brain. And I have no idea exactly why I kind of am split down the middle. I have, a, I have an idea, I have an inkling. Um, but as a creative that also has um, some of those skills, I was able to be successful as a musician, be successful. I have seven CDs out to record a CD is like orchestrating. It's, it's a huge undertaking. And then to do seven is, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm still alive. And then as a <laughs> classical violinist, I was the concert master of symphonies. That's a leadership role. It's very stressful. It's, you know, very difficult to, to get to, but instead of thinking of myself just as an artist, I've always been an entrepreneur within all of those creative endeavors. Yeah. So, so how did you get to that? So, so did you start out as, as a, as a musician and trans transition into an entrepreneur? Is that how that oh, kind of yes. worked? Out? Oh yes. Okay. I thought the only thing I would do on this earth, why I was put on this earth, my gift to the world was to be a performing artist. And there's, I mean, that would, that's great. And I did that. And I actually built this business Really, I've been doing aspects of this, this business since I was 15, but I created a, a real company in 2001, and it really was a lifestyle business to support my performing career. And as it took off and, and gained a momentum and had energy and legs, I began focusing more on it. And when I have, had felt I had put a stamp on the world um, with my music and did what I wanted to do. 
I no longer had to perform. It wasn't part of my, I must do this. My attention shifted to my business and guess what happens when you put a lot of energy, discipline, um, thought, leadership, studying, you know, all this energy into this business, I scaled and grew it uh, starting in there were, you know, there are different milestone markers, but I would say in 2015 is really when everything just shot through the roof and my business grew by 65% and continued to grow that much year after year. Wow. Wow. So I got to ask, so you've written a book and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, here in a bit, but so you mentioned recording CDs. So what is, I think I know based on how you described recording CDs, but what was, what's more, was more difficult writing a book or, or recording, say a CD? The book. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. And it's a similar process really, but some music for me was definitely a way that I could express myself. I could be my most creative self, but if you think about it, you know, I had to figure out what musicians, what instruments go on each song, figure out an arrangement of the song so they don't all sound the same, rehearse them, get everyone's books together, book the studio, learn how to do a take or two and then punch in and do solos. Like it's, it's a huge undertaking, but for some reason, the book, which is similar, right? You, you write and write and write, you have to edit, you find an editor, you have to find a graphic designer, you have to like, there's a lot of mechanics that are similar. It's actually, both of them are publishing, right? It's a publishing endeavor. But this book that I wrote is the story of my life. Even though my first record, I'm looking at it now, it's called Her Life, is the story of my life. It's shrouded in musical sort of interference. So even though I'm pouring my heart out, you may just be enjoying the melody or you might be enjoying the solo or you might be enjoying the bass line. And if you're not really listening to the words, then you're not really prying into my life. Now, some people did and some people really know me by that. But with a book, there's no hiding. And it, it does chronicle my life and not in such a poetic way as a song, right? Because I mean, I could write in beautiful prose but a song is more like maybe a poem or, you know, a painting and you can leave some things out. And of course you can do that in writing, but in this book, I was very open and vulnerable. And I said some things in the book that I hadn't even shared with my best friend or my therapist. So why did I think I could just put it in a book and then release it to the entire world to read in black and white? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So it just came out as you were writing, I said. Yes, it did. It just came out and I had to make sure that it was okay that it came out and got some feedback from other people. And they were like, yeah, you need to leave that in. This is why people will trust you. Yeah. Look, I love to hear that because I would, you know, I would think, especially you said you're being very vulnerable. You may do it in the initial writing, right? The initial draft. And then you go yeah. back and as you're, as you're going through and doing edits, you're like, mm, maybe I should take this part out or exactly. maybe I should leave this out. So <laughs> interest, very interesting there. So we're up against the break here, but again, we're talking this week with Natasha Miller. We're going to come back after the break. Of course, we'll give the Mr. Biz tip of the week, as we always do at the top of the second segment. And we're going to talk about her book a little bit, which is called Relentless, Homeless Teen to Entrepreneur Queen. And that's one of the reasons why I have her on the show. So come back after the break on Mr. Biz Radio. Business owners have a continually growing to-do list with little time for revenue-producing activities. With Check Off Your List and their experienced team of virtual assistants, you can focus on growing your business. Visit checkoffyourlist.com to learn how Check Off Your List's skilled team can handle your day-to-day -day tasks like social media, bookkeeping, calendar maintenance, and much more. Contact Check Off Your List at checkoffyourlist.com or call 888-262-1249 to see how their virtual assistants can help you live to work rather than work to live. Thank you for listening to Mr. Biz Radio. Did you know our show airs seven days a week for more than 30 hours now? If you are in the B2B space and would like to reach thousands of business owners every week, including our more than 250,000 social media followers, our thousands of daily internet radio listeners, our email list fans, and Mr. Biz Solutions members, email us at info at MrBizSolutions.com to become a sponsor. Tap into Mr. Biz Nation to help grow your business. 
Check out both of Mr. Biz's national best-selling books, Pathway to Profits, and How to Be a Cash Flow Pro on Amazon. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show. And it is, as I mentioned, the time for the Mr. Biz tip of the week. And this week's tip, I'm going to explain this a little bit, but hire people who will ask for forgiveness versus ask for permission. What do I mean by that? You don't want to hire someone who constantly need, well, depending on the role, but for the most part, <laughs> that constantly is going to ask for your, your permission for this. Should I do this? Should I do that? If you have to have that, first of all, you're going to be a micromanager. I would venture to guess that 90% plus people would prefer not to be micromanaged. You want to have someone who's got the confidence, the wherewithal, the knowledge, et cetera, and the fortitude to be able to make some decisions without asking you. Are they going to make some mistakes? Of course they will. And that's okay. But you want to make sure that you're hiring people that can do that because otherwise it's almost like you didn't delegate the work. If you go to delegate the work and they have to ask you every turn, should I do this? And I was thinking this, should I do that? It really doesn't take you out of the weeds as much as you necessarily need to, especially as a small business owner wearing all the different hats you're wearing already. So very, very important. Consider that as you're interviewing folks and considering them for different roles. At people look for people who will ask for forgiveness, meaning, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. Hey, Ken, sorry, I messed this up. Here's why I did it. Okay, we'll learn from it. We'll move on. As opposed to, Ken, should I do this? Ken, should I do that? Uh, very, very important. I learned that in my corporate career uh, through the school of hard knocks, I might add. But nonetheless, very, very important and especially important in a small organization, a small business, et cetera. So that is the Mr. Biz tip of the week. So Natasha, let's talk about this book. So I, I'm actually, you know, you I have to say, you gave me a little bit of hope. I was thinking about it during the break and the way you were describing initially um, how arduous it is to record a CD. When I asked you that question, you know, what's more difficult, I thought you would say CD, but since you said book, and since I've written some books myself, you've, you've given me new hope that I can still be a recording artist. I can still be a rock star, Natasha. I'm not uh, sure about that, but I think you could put, you could do it anything that you put your mind to, but it may not be in the cards for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, look, if you ask uh, Mrs. Biz, the Biz girls who have heard me sing and heard me, you know, see me play air guitar and whatnot, Mr. Biz and it's karaoke. definitely not in the cards. Yeah, it's definitely okay. not in the cards for me. Uh, but let's talk about the book. So again, the book is called um, uh, Relentless Homeless Teen to Entrepreneur Queen. Um, what, what made you write the book? What gave you the inspiration to say, gosh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta write a book about this. Well, first of all, I have to tell you, um, that it's actually entrepreneur dream, not queen. And if you have a oh. queen on your piece of paper, I mean, I I'm there for that too, but I don't know <laughs> if I would call myself a queen. That would be a little, uh, too much. So I think, you know, four years ago, I was at a conference with a bunch of seven, eight, nine figure entrepreneurs. We were all there to mentor each other. It was pretty expensive. It was at the Four Seasons in Vail. And I did not come there to discover that I needed to write the story of my life. However, that's what I left with. I had started mentioning for the first time in my life, some of the challenges that I had, which were pretty low inflection points compared to a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, who, by the way, 75% of us entrepreneurs have some deep-seated issues. And that sure. is a number that has you know, been reflected in, someone did a study of a lot of biographies and, and memoirs. But when I started to tell this group, some of the little bits and pieces of my life, I could feel them all just going, what? <laughs> and literally physically leaning in yeah. and they were giving up their time, their seat at the table to discuss what they wanted to discuss, to really focus on me and my story. And that's when I knew for sure that it would, it was time to write it. Of course, that was four years ago. Um, and a lot happened in the middle of writing it. And the difference between our books, I think, and why this one was very difficult for me to write versus writing about a, a subject matter or a topic that I'm an, an expert in, is that I have to account for all the people that I write about in the book, family members, stories that are challenging that you know I see from my vantage point, but they might not have seen from theirs. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So, um, and I can relate to that to some degree now. So my first two books were subject matter books about business, et cetera. And then my, my most recent book is, is something much more personal. Certainly not as personal as, as what you wrote, but there are a lot of personal stories in there and there are people in there. And I 
I went through that same process um, because, it, I, you know, maybe you struggle with the same thing is some of it, some of these things were, were very positive events. And some of them, I talk about people that mentored me and helped me along the way. And I want to recognize them in the book to say, uh, as, a, as a way of saying thank you. Yep. But I also want to be respectful. Like, you know, a lot of people were very private. They don't want to be mentioned. And, and I actually had someone, um, one of the people in the book that he, um, he's actually a private investigator. And he said, look, I, I don't, I don't want my name anywhere. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I appreciate I that. that as well. One of my um, advisors said, don't use my name. And there were reasons behind that, that I can't discuss now, but um, I understood completely. And, you know, I, it wouldn't have been good for him or me had I used his name. Yeah. So had you, before you went to that, that conference, had you had the idea of writing this book and you just had never pulled the trigger? I'd had the idea for 20 years before, but the thing is, is there wasn't, it wasn't the right time until four years ago. I wasn't, I didn't have as many successes to follow up some of the lower um, inflection points. And I didn't have the distance uh, between some of those inflection points to be able to reflect on. So I wasn't writing this book out of vengeance and I wasn't writing it to, um, you know, hurt anyone. And I think that's really important is that, you know, my story is pretty tragic. I was abandoned by my family on Christmas day when I was 16 at a youth homeless shelter. And I never got to move back home after that. Um, You don't really lead that with that in cocktail or coffee conversations, right? When you're trying to grow a business and prove your, your worth, to clients like the ones I have are Google and Apple and LinkedIn and Adobe, you, that doesn't come up at all ever. Right. Yeah. I can imagine until you get on the other side. And now I'm not going to lose clients because of this, but 20 years ago, somebody might've been like red flag, not sure about this one. Right. Cause I also wasn't in the right mind frame to discuss it the way that I am now. Yeah, I think that's important. And I like the distinction you made of, I know you're right, I hadn't really thought about it before, but I think you probably have to be a certain point beyond some of those events that you're going to talk about because of how, how damaging they were, how, how, uh, you know, how much of a, a tribulation it was in your life. And if you try to worry about it right after, it may come across, as you mentioned, as vengeance or be anger or whatever. <laughs> you have to be a certain point past that to be able to write about it and express yourself, but not in such a maybe as raw emotional way. Mm -hmm. Right. And I am very proud of what the book, how the book reads. I'm incredibly like the, the, you know, we're entrepreneurs. We want to be successful. We want to make money. Right. So my book is a wall street journal and USA today bestseller check. But what makes me feel the best is hearing from people with um, unbridled uh, reviews and and the men that are reading it and what what they're showing me and sharing with me is mind boggling because I'm a woman. It's a story about me. I didn't think too many guys would be interested. I'm hearing from there more them, for, you know, in, in spades. Yeah, yeah, and I can tell you, I feel the same way. I mean, the feedback that you get is is you know is is worth everything way, about yeah, writing way more important than how many books and how much money I'm making from the book. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, this week, we're talking with Natasha um, Miller and you can w- learn more at official Natasha Miller.com. We're going to hit a break. We're going to come back and she's going to teach us how to scale our business. Are you ready to automate your business? Automation is the key to scaling a business and building wealth. It's also one of the most difficult things for a small business owner to do on their own. If you're looking for help with automation, Pulse Technology CRM can help. We have an exclusive offer for Mr. Biz Nation. We will build everything for free, even if it's a sophisticated funnel. Visit thepulsespot.com forward slash Mr. Biz for this exclusive offer. If you find listening to Mr. Biz Radio is helpful, imagine having live access to not only Mr. Biz, but also five other trusted business experts. It's true. You can have live access to your very own CFO, plus a business attorney, a website and digital marketing expert, a sales and growth guru, a financing professional, and a customer experience master. Visit MrBizSolutions.com to learn more. 
Join Mr. Biz Nation at MrBizSolutions.com. To submit questions to the show, email them to info at MrBizSolutions.com. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show. And for those watching on video that just got treated to Natasha shaking her groove thing a little bit to the music, the intro music, I uh, appreciate that. Um, it's funny, uh, and producer Alan um, picked out the music or whatever. And well, he, you know, he picked it out and said, hey, do you like this? And I'm like, oh, it's kind of cool. It's different, not something you hear. And I'll tell you, at least 50% of the people we have on the show are doing do the same thing you do, right? You were doing. They're or dancing to the music or like, you know, something, right? It gets you kind of gets you going, which is good, right? We want we yeah. want energy. So um, so tell us, obviously you've learned a bunch about many different things uh, as an author as being a homeless teen to being, uh, you know, uh, writing the book and being a successful entrepreneur and working with some of the amazing people that you've worked with and companies you've worked with. So um, I was hoping I could pick your brain a little bit on some of the things that you've learned on how to, you know, scale and grow a business. Because, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, it's going to be super, super important to really have that growth abundance mindset, I think, especially as we're heading into probably some turbulent economic times right now. Right. Yes. Hold on. Brace yourself. Who knows uh -oh. what's going to happen, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, as far as scaling and growth, there's, you know, I could talk about the top three things, but they're so interwoven that you do have to kind of nail them all at a similar time in order for them to work to actually scale. So scaling means um, maybe, uh, I mean, growth and scaling are different things, right? You can grow sure. your top revenue and not really scale your business. You can't scale your business if you don't have systems and processes in place. And that those words are so overused now that they kind of are neutral, like blank words, right? So systems, that's plural. How many systems can one company have? Well, you could have a couple or a few, depending on the departments and how they, you know, how they operate. But the processes are the things that are done within that system. Uh, hopefully regularly and repeated the same way, documenting them, being able to train on them and then having everyone, you know, again, rowing in the same direction and small businesses, new businesses, they have processes, but they may not be in a system and they may not be the repeatable processes that really allow you to grow and then scale. So I, to me, that is the it's a really big part, but you can't have that working unless you have great people, unless everything's automated, but I digress. So what I did, which I think is really, um, I did this not to scale and grow, but because of efficiency, I built a system within Salesforce that was able to, we were able to run 777 events in one calendar year with two people in operations. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Now, those events were not necessarily full production. Some of them were just supplying talent to. So maybe one artist to 45 artists, but still there's a lot of logistics. There's a lot of repeatable low touch things that we were doing as a company manually. Well, you can't do, I mean, you, we, we couldn't do 777 events manually. So before that we were doing very, you know, much less, but the system, allowed us to scale and grow. So again, I created it just because of efficiency. I didn't want to double, triple, quadruple touch things. So that's really important. And then let's circle back to people. So how to conceptualize, figure out who you need or what role you need, and then how that fits into your puzzle, how to write a, a job description with outcomes that will then attract that person how to source and qualify those people. God save me. Like what is the number one challenge of every entrepreneur, every business? It's the people period, end of story, right? And it's cause we're human and we're not a system and a process in Salesforce, right? Right. People aren't automated. We might, we're, we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do but sometimes we do less or more or different. And that's, that's a challenge. So I think, those two things are bigger than any top three things I could talk about. Not that you asked for three, but. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I think it's so important. And I've seen the exact same thing is 
I think any company that's, I mean, even, you know, you could have a company up to, you know, between 75 and 100 people, and you've got someone maybe who's been there for 10 years, and they're, I'm going to date myself with this, but they're the Encyclopedia Britannica of the business in in whatever aspect of the business that they're involved in. And the process and the system is right here in their head. That is not okay. (laughs) God forbid something happens to them or, oh my gosh, you know, Susie's going to go on vacation for two weeks to Guatemala to do a mission. And what are we going to do for two weeks? Because she has done this for the last 10 years and she does it like so well. But it's it's all up here, and it, it's not a system that, that's replicatable, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, I feel like businesses that is the, the the ceiling on their growth is not their product, their service, how they deliver it. It's more so they don't have, I guess, some of it's how to deliver. But it's the, the systems, right? Again, the system is the system is Susie or the system is Bob. It's not in Salesforce. It's not an automated process, or it's not documented. And in a way that's effective enough to where when, when Susie's on vacation in that example, that I can easily go pick up her, her you know, process and procedures and go, oh, I can follow this. I do this and I do, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I, I work with businesses and I'm probably preaching to the choir on this where, you know, I'm very big on documenting those processes. as well. You have someone that's been doing it, this process or, you know, working the system for 10 years, five years, whatever. They know like the back of their hand. So they take for granted their knowledge. And so they write, they write it out step by step. Inadvertently, they skip three steps in between yeah. every step because to them, it's just natural. So then I pick it up and I'm like, I have no idea. I, I just, and they're like, oh, well, you're supposed to click that and then move to the right. And I'm like, you know how to solve that. for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You have to put that in there, right? Yeah. I would say, you know, interviewing Susie and having her uh, on a Zoom call recording it walk you through step by step by step while she's actually doing it on a test, whatever. And then using that video and also transcribing that video, then you won't have as many holes. You'll have, you'll still have some holes, but not as many as if you just say, Hey, Susie, can you just jot down all the things that you do in a day? Right. Yeah. So another question for you, uh, and it's tied to systems and people. I've also seen the instances, and I saw this in my corporate career as well, where you've got someone who's a master at whatever it is, right? They're part of the business and they're very hesitant to document it because in their minds, that's job security. Red they line. can't get rid of me Red because flag. I know how to do this and no one else does. And right. so they don't save their files on the network. They're on their, their local drive, nope. you know, all that kind Not of stuff. Not acceptable. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. But have you, have you run into that as well? I think that I set up a precedent uh, in hiring and onboarding and training um, that doesn't allow for that. And we're small enough, right, that I can, you know, if someone shares a Google document with me and I see that it's not on our drive, I immediately say that needs to go in this particular drive, right? Yeah, no, I think that's super important because um, I've gone into businesses where that's, you know, that scenario is playing out and it's like, you know, you got to go talk to the person and say, and it finally comes out and they just bluntly say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my job. Like, you know, this is, this is my job security is I know how to do this and no one else does. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, no, that's, that's not how we not, do this. Not acceptable. And it's, it is the company's intellectual, intellectual property. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, Natasha, we're uh, running out of time here very quickly, as as always happens, it seems like on the show, but you can go out to officialnatashamiller.com. That's officialnatashamiller.com. Also, follow her on Instagram. Uh, She's Natasha Miller SF, San Francisco. Uh, Again, Instagram, Natasha Miller SF. Um, Natasha, thank you so much for coming on the show. I loved loved hearing your insights and and some of your background. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you and and the way we did this. It was great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so guys, um, as always, appreciate you guys listening. Appreciate you watching. Uh, go out, follow Natasha. And as always, don't forget, have a great week and cash flow is king. This has been Mr. Biz Radio. To learn how to become part of Mr. Biz Nation, visit MrBizSolutions.com. 
for access to free weekly content, subscribe to the Mr. Biz YouTube channel and follow him on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. To listen to archive shows, you can find them on the Mr. Biz Solutions website.